Excusez-moi. Psalm 24. Um, in Psalm 24, let's just go ahead and read through it. It's only 10 verses. <clears throat> and this, before we do that, this is um, <clears throat> poetical books. My part, which is the Psalms. Tw lesson 12, Psalm 24. If you're good at math, <clears throat> if you're good at math, this is class 12, and 12 times 12 is 24, so we're on Psalm 24. Whatever. 12 plus 12. <clears throat> okay. Um, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they who dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the, holy, into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He who hath clean hands and a pure heart, <clears throat> who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them who seek him, who seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. <clears throat> All right. In our last class, we were discussing Psalm 19, and in Psalm 19, we were going over <clears throat> uh, how uh, the, you know, the stability of the creation in terms of the heavens. We saw uh, particularly it was focused in on the sun, representing the sun in his course. We saw the stability of the stars and the moon and, and <clears throat> all of the heavens in their course. But now in Psalm 24, we're going to look at the earth. Now the earth <clears throat> is different than the heavens. Can I get amen on that one? <laughs> the earth is different than the heavens. And you have to realize that, and it dealt with the heavens first, but now this psalm is dealing with the earth. Now, the good news is that uh, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and the world, and all those who dwell therein. And you have to notice that David is clumping together the earth with the world, and they are two different words, the earth is the planet, the world is the, is the world system, you know. Um, and then the people that dwell therein, and they who dwell therein. <clears throat> so, uh, and if you ever do a study on this, it, it is an interesting study, because a lot of times we read the world, and we think it's just talking about the globe. But the world there is actually talking about the world system. And, uh, and so, even though it is the Lord's, and the Lord is called Lord, the earth is the Lord's, <clears throat> there is still this, uh, these frailties in the earth, which we will look at more clearly through this psalm. There are frailties of the earth. There are frailties of us compared to, the, to Jesus. There are frailties of the earth compared to the sun. Okay? The earth would be dark without the sun. And so we'll get into these things, but um, the earth happens to be the place where man is placed. Okay. So there, we're confronted with that issue right off. <clears throat> um, the earth was created by God 
But what we'll see in this psalm is that it was created uh, with unstable forces so that there really is no rest, as it were, in the earth, that it doesn't come here. Um, and so this psalm is really about how man relates to earthly things and how that determines his path, uh, whether he's going to live by self or whether the frailties of this earth will actually lead you to God. Okay, So verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they who dwell therein. Um, it was, it is the Lord's, but it was established in such a way that we can find God if we allow it. Now let's face it, a whole lot of people don't find the Lord. But I want to go even deeper than finding the Lord as Savior. <clears throat> because this psalm is going to show us that, that there are forces, unstable forces set loose in this, on this planet uh, <clears throat> and in our earth life that is meant to shake us, that is meant to cause us, if we care enough, to look away and to look for answers beyond the earth, look for answers beyond earth life and that sort of thing. And so we find verse 2, for he hath founded it, talking about the earth, he hath founded it upon the, the seas and established it upon the flood. So here um, we see these un, some of these unstable forces. They are seas and, and uh, it is always confronted with upheavals of floods and of uh, things that destroy our comfortable life on this earth, things that shake our comfortable life on this earth, and, um, and, and everything we build on this earth. For example, a flood would come, and we built a nice, comfortable home with everything that we wanted in life, and we're comfortable, and a flood comes and takes it all away. We say, we, we see that on the news, and we go, why, you know, I mean, why, Lord, why, and yet, if our understanding is that, is that God is simply trying to make us comfortable in earth, we have not understood his plan. If we think that, it's not, that life is nothing more than what we get in earth life and that dwelling in this earth and drawing from this earth and being comfortable here. Well, I, I, remember, I remember when I was like, you know, a year old in the Lord. And, of course, my theology was a little different then. But I remember, you know, I was just a brand new Christian. And I thought, and, and I said it to a bunch of Jesus freaks that were standing around. I said, you know, if we get all comfortable in this earth and we have everything we want, why should we want Jesus to come back? I mean, I wasn't even a year old in the Lord, but I'm thinking... You know, if, he, if the whole thing is give us everything here, why would we even want Jesus to come back? And not only that, but if you think about it, then you, some people would even go, you know, I'm really happy here. Don't come back. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm, you know, but folks, our, our comfort, our, our rest is supposed to be in the Lord. Our relationship, everything that we have, here we go. Everything that we have that is stable is supposed to be in the Lord. And so God, yes, the earth is the Lord, and God set it upon unstable forces. And, and under, underneath the earth is this, this sea. A sea of what? Hot molten magma. <laughs> hot, hot molten lava. And, uh, and the earth's crust sort of revolves around on top of that and forces you know can break out at any time anywhere i mean you know i've lived in this area you know my whole life and in the last probably what three months we've heard of three or four different earthquakes in this area in this area and i've never heard of an earthquake before well they say it's it's probably due to all of the oil drilling that's been going on and the gas and the, you know, 
the propane that they're getting out of the ground and all of that that's been going on and it's making things unstable underneath. All that was stable for years, now there's an instability that's starting to take place and it's starting to cause earthquakes and stuff like that. Well, you know, somebody might say, I'm moving from Los Angeles or, or San Francisco. I'm going to move to the Dallas area where it's safe, where I don't have to worry about an earthquake. Uh, the earth is unstable everywhere, you know. Uh, somebody says, I'm going to move away from the ocean so I don't have to face a hurricane. You know, a, a, uh, a hurricane is like in the old horror movies, like the mummy, you know, it, it like comes at you like this, you know, if you can run, you can get away, you know, or Frankenstein, you know, uh, but a tornado is like, you know, some sort of newfangled one that just jumps on you out of the blue, you know, ah, it's got you. <clears throat> so, you know, it, but it's unstable everywhere. And it's meant to be that way. God founded the earth on the seas and on the floods and on these things that, that bring upheavals and, and destroy life as we know it. Um, well, the goal would be that we begin to realize nothing is truly stable here. And we begin to look away and we begin to look to God's answer. Now, now when I say this, of course, I'm not just talking about... Uh, finding Jesus as Savior, yes, that's important. Let's go ahead and establish that. But this psalm is going to get into things that are far beyond just finding Jesus as Savior, just finding him to fix or, or finding him as Lord in the sense that most Christians use that term. When we talk about Jesus being Lord, we don't talk about him being governor of our lives and our attitudes and our character. We mean he's governor over my, my wallet, which I think I left at home. He's governor over, you know, uh, the devil when he attacks me. He is, lo meaning he's Lord. He, G when we say Jesus is Lord, we mean he can, he's, he's like sort of a glorified repairman. You know, jack of all trades. He can fix anything. Jesus is the best repairman I've ever had. He can fix anything. Folks, to honor him as Lord is so much beyond that. You know, I mean, uh, in the old days, you walked in before the Lord. Uh, you bowed, I mean, you would be brought down. We're not. No, 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 oh, Jesus. Jesus, come here, quick, fix this. So there's a, first of all, there's just a detachment with the truth and true reality as, as it really is into a religious truth that just makes Jesus exist for one reason. My comfort, my happiness, my earth life. When in reality, he has things that are in his heart, why he created you, why he created the earth, that is beyond earth life, that is beyond relating to him based on what he does for you, and moves into the things that are, are very dear to his heart. <clears throat> so uh, we move to verse 3 then, and it says, then who? I mean, the question is, if, if, if the earth is the Lord's, but he has founded it on unstable uh, uh, realities and things uh, that, that can, floods and whatever, that can throw you into uh, a tizzy over your earth life, then the, then the next question is who? And that's the first word of verse 3. Who then? Who? Who shall ascend? Who shall ascend? Who's going to get out of the earth? Who's going to ascend? Who's going to leave the upheavals of the earth? Who, not, not just by, quote, unquote, the rapture or some method like that. Who is going to see that the earth was meant to be unstable so that we would seek after God. And we'll see that in just a few verses from here. <clears throat> Who is going to do more than cry out to God, fix my earth life? Who, who is going to do that? Who among Christians, who is going to do more than say, God, you know, fix, you know, 
bring in the insurance money to fix the house that was ruined by the flood. Who's going to do better than that? Who's going to say, who's going to ascend? Who is going to go up to where God's at, to where the things of him that are stable are at, to begin to find true, stable realities that we manifest in the earth? Yes, we manifest, but you don't find it in the earth. You don't find it. So who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now, what is, what is the most common name used for the hill of the Lord? Zion. Zion. <clears throat> and I won't go deeply into it, but folks, Zion is the most dear thing to the heart of God. David found this out, and David was the one who spent his whole time, his whole kingdom. I mean, he was king, and he spent his whole kingship as a servant to the true king to bring about Zion and therefore from that to bring about um, Solomon's temple, which all is brought down to one thing, a habitation of God, that he, was, that he worked toward that end. And you've got to remember, David wrote this. So the very man who started his kingdom bringing the ark into Zion, that's how it started, pretty good start. Nice start. And ended with Solomon's temple so that the, the habitation for God would be wider, bigger than what it was before. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, you know, we, for example, if we said, Lord, uh, you know, in a, in a sincere prayer, Oh, Lord, enlarge my heart. Well, what does that mean to us? You know, to him it means I dwell in you. And you're asking to kick out the borders so that there's less of you in there and there's more room for me. There's less of your attitudes and there's more of my spirit. There's less of the way that you would do things and more of the way that I would do things. See, I mean, that's what that prayer really means. I mean, we. All that's changed, you know. I mean, really, a lot of times we just pray that and it just sounds spiritual, but we're not even sure what we're asking. Oh, Lord, enlarge my heart, you know. Well, could you write down what that means that you, since you just prayed that? Well, I don't know, but I've heard it prayed and it sounded really spiritual. And I want to be spiritual, so I'm going to pray just like that with no meaning behind it. But at least others who hear me pray will think I'm spiritual. You know, the only thing that's truly spiritual is him. He is spirit and he is life. And we are the, earth, we are the earthen vessel and he is the treasure. And to enlarge the, the, the borders of our being is to say to him, we want more room in this vessel and in this house and in this temple for your life and less about my comfort in my life. Does that make sense? You know, and, and it, I think it's, it's flowing perfectly with, with what the scriptures are saying here. It is, and, and could we expect anything less from David? <laughs> You know, the man whose heart is after God, not his heart is... I mean, look at the difference between him and Saul. King Saul, his heart was after what he could get. He would never wait on God. He wasn't look. He, he was... King Saul was glad he had God so God could defeat his enemies. Well, is that all that the Lord is to us? We're just King Saul? And if you've ever done a, ever done a good search on that, and it really is a good search, if you really look into it, Saul, King Saul represents the soul and King David represents the spirit. And the soul is always fighting against the spirit to not allow the life, because where does God dwell? In our spirit. Not to allow the life of Christ to come forth. Saul, the soul, wants to make the decisions Saul, the soul, wants things the way that will be comfortable for itself. But David represents the spirit and represents oneness with the Lord because in our spirit, he that is joined to the Lord is one spaghetti. 
I'm just seeing who's listening because it's one spirit. <laughs> it's one spirit. And so um, David is, is uh, always being pushed down, always being held back always being trying to, to be annihilated so that the soul can win. Well, folks, we may look at Saul and say, you know, I'm not like Saul, I'm like David. No, in your spirit, maybe you are if you're lucky, uh, but in your soul, you are like Saul. Because when we get in the flesh, we want our way. Hmm? Is, that's not news to anybody here, is it? And, and that shouldn't offend anybody here unless you know it's true. You just don't like it being pointed out. You know. All right. So, um, <clears throat> so there is this place. All of a sudden, the upheavals come in the earth, and to escape the floods, we have to move to higher ground. Amen. But what is this calling higher ground? Zion. That's the higher ground. The place where we become his habitation and he becomes the life in the home, in the house. He lives in us. Not, not just he lives in us and we live in us. And we're sharing an apartment. <laughs> you know. First of all, you know, maybe this has worked for some of you, but if you've ever had to share a, a, an apartment with somebody or if you've ever had some relatives or somebody come move in with you for a couple of weeks, has anybody ever had that happen? And, and you just go, you know, after a few days, the way they do things and the way they'll go in the kitchen and do something and then they'll, they'll set up, the, you know, they'll do something in the bathroom or, do, you know, whatever. And you're looking and, and the first conclusion you come to is, they're very different than I am. <laughs> they are very different than I am. Uh, and they just arranged, just arranged my kitchen in the way that they like it. In my home. Anybody felt, honestly, has anybody ever felt sort of indignant over something like that? Guess what? The Lord feels that every day with you. <laughs> arranging everything and rearranging what he's trying to set up you know and when you see it like that maybe you'll go oh you know what he must increase and I must decrease you know you see and so anyway so there is this this situation where verse 2 begins to kick in and so the person and in this case thank God it's David but David has given us the example and thank God for a heart after the Lord so he's given us the example where, I mean, because if it wasn't David, if it was Saul, then all these upheavals and uh, the earth being founded on floods and, you know, stuff like that, uh, we would be Saul and we would never go to higher ground. We would, we would start getting sandbags and put them all around our house. And we would try to stay in low ground. And you know, folks, there are people like that. There are people all along the Mississippi. There are people all along other rivers. There are people that, that they are, there, there will be floods. There's no question about it because the earth is founded on floods. And they know that. And so they're already all the time with the sandbags and stuff. They're not going to move. They're not going to go to higher ground. Folks, the normal thinking would go, it's flooding. Let's get out of the flood plain. I mean, that would be, that's not even like special thinking. That's called common sense, not uncommon sense. That's, my God, that's uncommon sense. There's a hill over there, we're standing here drowning. Yeah, let's, let's go, you know. Or, no, help me with these sandbags. See, now... The problem is, is our country is messed up where we have in flood insurance. Well, they'll pay for everything, and every time there's a flood, you know, they'll come in and they'll fix everything. And this is true with hurricanes on the ocean, folks. 
The hurricanes, you know they're coming sooner or later, and these people have insurance, and it doesn't matter if it flattens them. The insurance pays for another house. They, you know, nobody says, we will not do this again. They don't do that, you know. So they say, that's exactly what it is, or less nowadays, but, you know. <clears throat> and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of this, but I'm thinking, in David's time, they probably didn't have flood insurance. It's just a thought. But <clears throat> so, so David thinks through this, and he, so he goes, okay, now who's going to send, who's going to go up? Who is going to, to move to higher ground? But in his case, he's calling that higher ground Zion because to him, he's speaking of spiritual realities. He's not just talking about getting out of a flood or something like that. He's saying the spirit realm created the material realm. The spirit realm is more real than the material realm. When the material realm is gone, the spirit realm will still be around. So David is saying... So everything in the material realm is only a picture, a shadow, something to help us see higher truths and higher realities. So that's where he's coming from. He's going, his answer, and who's going to go, who's going to uh, move to higher ground? His answer is, who will ascend unto the, whole, the, the hill of the Lord? Who's going to not ask God to fix it down here, but to move where God is? You know, and keep your place here. Well, you don't even have to turn there. I'll, I'll uh, find it real quick. Um, most of you are familiar with it. Um, Colossians 3 says, If you then be risen with Christ, wait a minute, I'm not raised yet. Yes, you are. If you then be, and this word is, the word if here is actually, since you then be risen with Christ. If you need to know where that scripture is, I'm in Colossians 3, 1 through 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. And as I say every time I read that scripture, folks, it says set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. It didn't say not on earthly things. We read it. See, we read it. And we read it the way it's been interpreted to us. We don't just read it. If you just read it, you would read not on things on the earth, which is doesn't matter if it's an earthly thing or whatever, you know. Because we say earthly things are, you know, well, Calvin Klein jeans and, you know, a certain kind of shoes and, you know, da-da-da-da, and don't set your affection on those, but set your affection on something else on the earth. That scripture is just as clear as it can be. It says, don't set your affection on things on the earth. Why? Because the earth is built on unstable forces intentionally by God so that he can bring us in to something higher. And um, so I, I think I need to read here because I've, I've got quite a bit left to, to cover. Um, to escape the floods, we must move to higher ground. God made physical higher ground, but he made it to represent the Holy of Holies. Okay? Meaning, because that's where Zion is. Zion, just, just to make this clear, Zion was only the Holy of Holies. Moses' tabernacle had the outer court and the inner court and the Holy of Holies. But when David got the ark, he just had the Holy of Holies. He didn't have all that other stuff. See? So David says, why, you know, don't, let's not stay out here in the outer court of the earth realm, physical, outer court, inner court, soul, sanctuary, or Zion, Holy of Holies, where the spirit reality of everything comes from. And so, um, so the question here in verse 3 begins with who? And then after that question, there's another one. Or who shall stand in his holy place? And then he begins to describe it. He who hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. 
um, it, he's, uh, he's not just, you know, Let me just read that. God didn't just randomly save him, but he rejected the unstable earth and sought God's chosen higher ground. And, and the higher ground of Zion is this, spiritually. The higher ground of Zion is not having Christian values in how you operate your business. The higher ground of Zion is not, because that's, that's how you live in the earth. The higher ground of Zion is not having a Christian home where you pray over meals, because that's living in the earth. The higher ground of Zion is where it begins to touch, um, see I wrote it down here somewhere, but I, you can read it here, hands, heart, soul, um, it begins to affect you spirit, soul, and body, hands, heart, and soul. It began, it, it, it touches you from top to bottom. It, um, I'm in the process of preparing for next time that I share on, on Psalms, and I'm, I'm writing on this thing that, that shows that how some people will be indignant about injustice that someone does to them right here but then they will go do unjust things to get back at them, which proves that they are not indignant over injustice. They are indignant over what happened to them personally. It's a personal issue. It's not a righteous issue or a, you know, they make it a righteous cause, but it's not a righteous cause. Because if, if, if you are upset over their un, injustice, you'll be upset over injustice that would try to come out of you towards someone also. Clean hands, clean heart, clean soul. It's starting to affect being, not just doing. Do you know that it's possible to have a Christian home uh, where you pray over your meals and stuff like that? And you're not really transformed in that manner that we just described. I mean, am I right or wrong? I mean, it's possible to do all, you know. It, you can go to church and tithe and pray uh, at night and uh, you know, do all the things, you know, Bible read and all that kind of stuff, and not even be born again. Yeah, well, I didn't want to say that because I'm already being beat to death for what I already share, but. But, you know, I mean, it really is true. Uh, I was, uh, I, I was raised in the Methodist Church, United Methodist Church, growing up. Folks, when I got born again, I thought no, nobody ever mentioned getting saved or born again in the church and that every one of those people would have died and gone to hell if somebody, you know, if somebody didn't come in with, with the truth. But you can even get born again and go through the motions of all that and still have wrong ways of relating uh, still be self-centered while you're not you know let's say before you were saved you were totally selfish no this is what you said to your parents no I want it now I want you to buy me this now I, I'm, I'm gonna okay that's that's just totally self-centered but you know you can become a Christian and only get involved in things that appeal to you and that's that's self self-centered the other is selfish this is self-centered it's the self is still the center of all the Christian activities that you do, and you pick and choose based on that. You know, I've told this story before, but when when I went to Bible school back in my early twenties, uh, they had a choice of different things. I mean, there was Bible, and then there were certain uh, other activities you can be involved with, and some was auto mechanics, and some was teaching in a Christian school, and and uh, one area was music. And uh, everybody thought, all my friends thought, you know, you're going to go into the music area because I'd played music all my life, you know. And by getting into the music area, I could excel immediately. Do you understand what I'm saying? I could be somebody without really having to, without really needing the Lord. 
Yeah, on my own. I could excel because I already knew music. I already played music. I wrote songs and did all this kind of stuff. And so when it came time to choose, I chose an area I hated and that I didn't really have an interest in, but I said, you know what? It's going to take Jesus. You know what the area was? Teaching. <laughs> Hated it and didn't want to teach kids and didn't want, you know what I mean? And just said, no way, man. But, but then I said, I mean, you know, it's like the Lord spoke to me or whatever. And I thought, you know, this other is not going to be Jesus. I want Christ in my life. I want it to be Jesus. And it's not going to be Jesus by me constantly seeking the comfortable areas for my flesh. Does that even make sense? And I just went, you know, Lord, I'm going to take this tough area. And I had a hard time for a long time. <clears throat> but then the Lord began to come through. And it was amazing to me because it was an area that was beyond me at the time. Just beyond me. Just totally beyond me. Well, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not saying that to talk about me. I'm trying to talk about a principle. And the principle is <clears throat> that we need the Lord. And we need to quit putting ourselves into comfortable situations that are easy for us, that make us look good. Well, I don't want to look bad. Well, how about this? Is it okay to look bad and say, I'm, I'm really not sufficient, but I happen to be one of those that believes Jesus is, and I, I'm going to trust him. And even though everybody else looks good and I look bad, know that I look bad because I'm really going to get the Lord out of this. And y'all, all you good people, pray for me. Would that be okay? I mean, would that just, you know, and then, well, no. Some people say, no, that wouldn't be okay. I don't want to look bad. I don't want people to think I'm an idiot. Well, you're the only idiot in the group. Well, I'd have to go, yes, I am. I really need Jesus. So we should begin every gathering with praying for me, that Christ will be formed in me. Well, praise God for that. See, I don't mind looking like an idiot if I'm going to get the Lord out of it eventually. And it really, 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 anybody hearing me? Really will be the Lord, you know. Praise God. So... <clears throat> Um, so it represents with one with clean motivations clean heart clean motivations not selfish motivations but clean and Lord I just want you at any, any cost believing any, see I, I really am going to have to read a bunch of this before we get through here but when we say Lord I want you at any cost does anybody, if, has anybody ever prayed that but when you're saying it or when you thought to pray it you go I better not pray that <laughs> Lord I want you at any cost no Lord I only thought that I wasn't really praying it <laughs> and here's why here's, here's why we hesitate because we don't really know what that means to him. We know what we think it means. To him it means, then I am going to bring you through certain things that are going to actually form my son in you. Yeah, and that's pure. He's pure on that. He's not thinking this. He's not thinking, he's not thinking, Lord, I want you at any cost. And he goes, <laughs> No! Nah. No, I'm going to be able to bring evil upon you. He can bring evil on you anytime he wants, you know. <laughs> but what we are saying is I'm opening up my flesh where you can deal with it. Well, let's face it, that's not going to be fun no matter what road you walk down, yeah. right? But the question is, do you want the Lord? Because you can't be a vessel full of flesh and say, fill me with Jesus because you're already full of you. I mean, you just got to be real about these things. And you go, okay. But would it be okay if what he took you through, when you got to the end, number one, it really was the Lord, really, really was the Lord. And, and number two, you could look back and say, you know, that was really tough, but I wouldn't have had it any other way because I know I couldn't have gotten Jesus like this. 
clean, clean heart, pure heart. Okay. I have been through circumstances that I have said there is no way I'll ever be able to say this was worth it even though it was hard. I, I know I will always say it was so much worse than what I got out of it. But the truth is when I got to the, the certain juncture, you look back and you know, you know, something in you, you know, I never would have gotten what I have now. Never staying in my comfort zone. And I am so happy with the Lord and with an increase of Christ and less of me that I can say to get Jesus in this manner is worth it. And I, did, and I could say that. And after all, isn't everybody that is truly going to go forward in the Lord going to go through that and say that? Aren't, I mean, because people who don't, you know, people are just going to, you know, they're going to, they're going to sit in their little cubicle and they're going to make that thing the most comfortable in the world. Adam does that, you know. I've often said, if you dug a ditch, a big hole in the ground, you threw Adam in it, the old man, the flesh, well, at first he'll sit and whine and go, well, I'm in the dirt, I'm in a ditch. But after a while, he'll start carving out and smoothing out a nice sort of a the thing where his legs are up and his head's back like this. And then he'll dig out a little place, you know, where he can you know, put his arm like this, you know, and stuff like that. And pretty soon, he, because he's got one thing on his mind, I must be comfortable. If I'm going to be in this situation, I'm going to be as comfortable as I can. You know, you... You can build your own little cubicle and say, you know, well, at least I'm not miserable. Well, who's talking? The flesh. <laughs> you know, I know this is insane. But this is the truth. It is the truth. Amen? <clears throat> All right. Reading time here. <clears throat> So verse, verse 5, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This man gets blessing and right relationship. God didn't just randomly save him, but he rejected the unstable earth and sought God's chosen higher ground. Okay? And then verse uh, 6, this is the generation of them who seek him, who seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. So here it's saying that this is, they're, they're a seed or a generation. Okay? Well, that's the seed of Christ, folks. That's Christ being formed in us. That generation is a seed, and it keeps coming forth generation after generation because it's Christ in this person, then that one, then that one. You're not even related to this person or that one or that one, but as time moves on during your generation, you let Christ be formed in you. So that's the seed. And then the person over here, maybe you never even met, did the same thing in the next generation. And it was the seed. And then one down there. And then you pass away. And then this one and this one and this one. But it's one long generation. But it's one seed. Christ in all of them. Christ formed in all of them. That's the seed that he's talking about here. This is the generation of them who seek him, who seek thy face, O Jacob. And so clearly, this is, he's, he's speaking, he's not speaking to you and me. He's speaking to Jacob. Do you understand what it's saying right there? What does it mean when I say he's speaking to Jacob? He's speaking to that Jacob part of you that tries to serve God, tries to get the blessing of God. Remember what he did? He said, oh, I want God. I seek God. I seek God, and I want the blessing of God. And so what does he do? He tricks his brother, cheats him out of his birthright. Now, the good thing is, or, or the bad thing is, his brother didn't care whether he got it or not and sold it for one, you know. Yeah, but Jacob did care. So Jacob had the heart, amen? Amen. But he didn't have the ways. His ways were still flesh. Okay? And so he's saying, Oh, Jacob that seeks the Lord, this is going to be your answer, another seed on the inside of you. 
you'll be a prince with God. That's when Christ begins to be formed in you. It's called Isaac. Or, or Israel, I'm sorry. Israel, it's called Israel. All right, so, um, and of course here, it's, it's the generation of them who are seeking his face, not his hands. Because when you see, if you seek his hands, you're wanting him to do something for you. If you seek his face, you're wanting to be changed into the same image from glory to glory. Doesn't that scripture say that? You seek his face. See, someone can say, I'm seeking the Lord. I'm seeking his face. Well, ask them what they're seeking, and they're probably looking for his hands to fix something for them, to help them to do something. They can say, I'm seeking his face, but they're actually seeking his hands. Does that make sense? Because they want him to, to do something with his hands, to fix something. But, but you can. You, uh, absolutely, you certainly can, because he's, he's whole. But very few seek his face, but this is the generation that does because they are unstable in this earth and instead of trying to get God to fix the earth, see that's the key, they're not just trying to get him to fix the earth, they believe that if looking into his face will cause me to change into his same image from glory to glory, then whether the earth changes or not, they're going to be okay, right? Amen. For example, Jesus walking in the earth, you know, he's walking, everybody around him is selfish, but him. Everyone's motivation, anybody that does anything toward him, they're selfish because they've not yet died on the cross. They have not yet been crucified with Christ. Am I right or wrong? Everything about everything. But you never see Jesus going, stopping and just going, this is, I just hate this and I hate all of you people. And this is your miserable yuckos. You never see that with Jesus, you know. Because he's okay within himself. Everybody else doesn't have to be right for him to be able to live for God. Can I get amen? amen. <laughs> or at least can I get an oh me? <laughs> you know? Everybody doesn't have to be right for Jesus to be Jesus. But for us, we're always looking for everything. You know, oh, I don't like this. I, Lord, fix that. Move that. See, but when you see his face, you begin to be changed into that same image, that same nature, that same spirit. And then the upheavals on the earth don't change Jesus. The problems in the earth don't change Jesus. And in fact, a leper comes up to Jesus and Jesus doesn't go, get away from me. Don't touch me. No, 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 no. If you touch me, I'll get leprosy. This earth, this earth is an upheaval and everything. But no, no, no. Jesus touches him. And what happens? The what is Jesus goes into him and he's changed instead of going, ah, you know. I need to read. I've got to get this over with. It is a generation of seed. They are identified as those who seek him and seek his face. We're not seeking blessing or righteousness, or even correct doctrine, but we're seeking him, the generation of them that seek him. It is God's presence as, as in us being a habitation, Zion. It is movement from what is unstable to what is stable. What is stable, folks? Christ. The Lord who created the earth and oneness with him is the only stability, but you don't gain it by seeking it, you gain it by seeking him. Did you hear what I said? You're not seeking stability in the earth. You don't seek the Lord for stability. You seek the Lord who is stable. And you begin to conform to his image. Then verse 7, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. It looks like a changed subject, but it didn't. Because here this person has realized, or David has, and, and those who read this have realized the real earth is us. We're the earth. You, you remember Jesus said, when you pray, pray this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What's it say? In earth. Not on. Have you ever looked at it? Actually, it's in earth, not on earth. And that's where we miss it. See, again, we just read the scriptures as to what we've been taught instead of what it's really saying. It's in our earth. And it's in us that the change has to come, not changing the earth. Well, the best thing to do is look it up because 
There could be, because he quotes that about two or three different places, and I'm pretty sure all of them are in, but if you'll check it out for me, I'd appreciate it, because if, if it says on on any one of the ones that he does, I, I'll need to know that. <clears throat> um, all right, so, um, <clears throat> so we are the earth, therefore we are what's unstable. We are unstable. We need to lift up our heads because we're still on the earth and of the earth and earth. And look above, look above what? Look above the floods. Look above the floods and see him and then open our hearts, our doors, and let the king of glory come in. Now I want you to notice that verse 7 says, let the king of glory uh, and the king of glory shall come in, not come back. Are y'all seeing that, verse 7? He didn't say, let the king of glory come back. <laughs> it says, come in. We all want the king of glory to come back, set up a throne on the earth, and beat up all the enemies. Did you find one? Okay. We, we, but this says, let the king of glory come in, verse 7, not come back. And, and we're missing it because we're waiting for an event instead of allowing what we can have right now to happen. As I said, if Jesus came and sat on a throne and defeated all of our enemies, that'd be great. But Jesus defeated all of his enemies when he walked in the earth by his nature by just not being open and tempted. And Amen? He defeated them by nature. Okay, so... so so David says, we're the earth. Let's lift up our heads above the floods and ask the, the stable one to come in. Amen? Um, <clears throat> we are unst unstable earth and he is the stability. The throne of God is not in the mountain but in us because we are Zion. The stability he wants to bring us uh, bring is in us and not to the world. Because remember Jesus said, I pray not for the world, but for those who are in the world. I mean, if I, you know, if I was standing there, I'd say, no, 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 Jesus, don't pray that. Pray for us, you know, pray for the world. Let's get this place fixed. Folks, he's not trying to fix the world. Did you know that? If he is, he's not very good at it. He's had 2,000 years, or actually longer than that, to fix it. He's just not very good at it. Look around. Let's be real. I mean, let's really look at it. Folks, if he's trying to fix it, he's either not good, or he's really not trying to fix it. He's trying to fix you and me. Okay? So that's why the king of glory has to come in. The earth is the Lord's, and we are the earth. Amen? Amen? <clears throat> But though he is the owner, because the earth is the Lord's, which makes him what? The owner. But though he is the owner, we must give Jesus that place to come in. Not just own us. You know, I own a ranch down in, in central Texas, but I'm not possessing it. I'm just owning it. I'll tell you what's possessing it. Wild pigs and, and, and uh, 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 wild growth bushes and, and stuff. That's what's possessing it right now. Okay? But I do own it. But if, the, if that ranch would say, w open the front gate and let the, you know, the owner come in to possess, then we might see some change down here. Is that, does that make sense? <clears throat> Uh, he gave us dominion, which is stewardship. A lot of people misread dominion. It's stewardship, but not ownership of the earth. He didn't give us ownership. He owned it. The earth is the Lord's. <laughs> you know, we're just stewards of it and not very good ones. Uh, <clears throat> we have not done well with our stewardship. God is owner, not just of the earth, but those who dwell therein. We are dwelling in the earth, but in actuality, it is about letting the Lord dwell in us. The question isn't, what, what, what must we do to please God, or how do we gain peace? It is who. And that is seen in, uh, 
Where's the next verse? Uh, verse 8. Who is this king of glory? <laughs> it's about knowing him. Who? A who, not a what. A lot of people have questions for God, you know, right? That's what most prayers are, questions for God. And most of them de deal with what or how, you know, why. But very few are who. They're not, they're not about learning who he is. They're finding out something. I mean, I remember, you know, again, this was like my first year of, of being a Christian. And somebody said, well, if, if, if you went up to heaven, if you could be jerked up to heaven, you know how Jesus freaks are. If you could be jerked up to heaven and, and ask Jesus one question, what would it be? I said, is Elvis up here? <laughs> I don't have enough sense to know what, you know. <clears throat> so who is the king of glory? <laughs> who is this king of glory? Well, he's the, he's the creator, but he's the creator of the earth. But he's more than that. He wants to be more than the creator and the owner. He wants to be the possessor. <clears throat> um, he has a nature, a way, an approach of attitude that must come in. Okay, this is not about the king of glory coming back, but coming in. The question is also who? Who shall ascend? Who will acknowledge being raised? Because we are risen. Are we going to acknowledge that? Or are we going to stay down here on the earth and act like it didn't happen? <clears throat> who? That's the question. It's our question to him. Who is this king of glory? It's his question back to us. Who, who's going to ascend? Who is going to quit trying to get me to fix the unstable earth, which I founded on the floods, <laughs> and ascend up here with me in my resurrection, be seated with me in heavenly places? Who will acknowledge being raised? Who shall make his stand in the holy place? Not who will do the right thing in the earth, but who will leave the earth and the outer court? We keep trying to make our earth life more holy as we look to the throne instead of letting him come in. And there is the throne within us. The king of glory comes in. <clears throat> and then, of course, verse 8, a little further. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord in battle. Who is the king of glory? The one who is strong and mighty and calms the seas and floods and storms and disciples. Because you remember when the disciples were in the boat and the storm came out and they were, ah, Jesus is asleep in the boat, you know. How can you be asleep during a storm? You know, and they said that. Don't you care? Folks, has there ever been a storm? Has there ever been a flood? Has there ever been something and you said to the Lord, don't you care because he was at rest? And you're going, why don't you fix this? Folks, he's wanting us to be joined with him He's wanting us to be in him and he in us so that, as it were, we're asleep in him. If he's at rest, I'm at rest, you know. But because we don't think in terms of oneness, we think in terms of separate. We go, don't you care? You're asleep, but look at this storm. So he, he, he calms the storm and he calms the disciples. But that's not his way that he wants to do it. He doesn't want to just, you know, calm the disciples by calming the storm. He wants to calm the disciples by the king of glory coming in and living in his peaceful life, living in his way that is not all churning and moaning and, you know, like a flood and, psh, and all this grime floating around, you know, and snakes in the water and all this kind of stuff. But, but literally at peace by Christ because he is our peace. Now, now how, you know, how are we fully going to even know what that means? I'm going to tell you how. You'll never get that by listening to me or anybody else talk. You get that strictly by the Holy Spirit because you have been saying, who is this king of glory that wants to come in? You know, who, how is he? Well, he is the prince of peace. 
You know, he reigns in us as Prince of Peace. We say, he's the Prince of Peace. So when he comes back, my God, how long are we going to have to wait? Why can't he be the Prince of Peace today? Why can't he be the Prince of Peace in our circumstances? Today. And, and I want to tell you something. I'm not just saying all this because it's right. I'm saying this because I am actively in circumstances where I have to, as it were, change lives. I have to get out of me and into him. I have to acknowledge I am crucified and Christ lives in me because the scriptures declare that to be the case. And when I do, and when I do that in faith, and when I do that in a true reality and not some sort of a, you know, this is what we teach at New Creation, and so let me fake myself out. <laughs> you know, but a real way, the Prince of Peace actually reigns under incredible, ugly circumstances, and love reigns, and joy reigns, and I weep and say, I am not worthy of the slightest manifestations of such a beautiful person as this King of glory who lives in me. And I'm humbled to my core because I know it's not I but Christ. Amen. And I know it. I know it. I know what I'm like. But I also know what he's like. So, so you know, I mean, I'd love to teach this into you. <laughs> but I can't. Each person, I mean, that's why David said, who? David didn't say, all of Israel will, because I'm going to teach them. He did teach them, and they didn't get it. Most of them didn't have it. He's saying, who? And to this day, God, or well, to this day, David is saying, who? Is it going to be you? Will you ascend? Will you see things high? Will you move to higher ground? Or will you just stay where you are and ask God to bless that? All right, so um, uh, instead of uh, appealing to the king on a faraway throne to remedy the outward instabilities of planet Earth, we appeal to him to come in. <laughs> Hallelujah. From there, the throne in our hearts, he calms the storm, he wins the battles. Hallelujah. And then verse, verse 9 is, is a repeat. It's an exact repeat of verse 7. Who is this king of glory? Well, it's not an exact, but it's, it's basically a repeat. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Selah. And I wrote down, it's almost as an echo, bouncing off the mountain, back down into the valley of the floods. You know? Just continually sending forth this truth and letting it echo off and come back to us again in our flooded lives so that we will get it and then ascend with him instead of being caught down here and always asking him to fix earth life. All right, let's go ahead and take a break and we'll come back for class number two in a few.